So uh, I'd like to invite you to um, bring your attention to your in-breath and your out-breath. We will be listening to the bell, to the sounds of the bell together. And so let us breathe together as one body. You may want to close your eyes. It's easier to focus on the, on the breathing uh, with our eyes closed so that we would not be distracted. Bring your attention to your belly, to the rising and falling of your belly as you breathe in and out. Relax your shoulders, your arms, your legs, your whole body, and offer yourself a gentle smile. And as you hear the sound of the bell, allow it to sink deeply into your body, into every cell of your body, into the depths of your consciousness, so that the bell can tap into our healing capacity, the body and the mind's capacity to heal. Dear respected Thai, dear Sangha, it's so wonderful to see so many f familiar faces and also new faces. I, um, ever since we have to step up in place of Thai to offer the teachings and practices to, to the Fofo Sangha. I found it, I found there are two kinds of audience that are quite challenging to speak to. First audience, the monastics. They have heard from the best, a teacher. So now, when we step up, you know, some of our monastics may be more knowledgeable than I am, may be better practitioner than I am. And also our monastics, you know, we live in together and they know who we are. So if you come up here, they know if we're for real or we're just philosophizing. 
And I found the other kind of audience are long-term practitioners, like you, some of you. Some of you have probably came to the Dharma before I have, so you know a lot, right? And so I've been reflecting on the, um, the beginner's mind. How do we maintain our beginner's mind so that we're always open, so that we're receiving the teachings as if we are listening and receiving it for the first time? Do you know when you first listen to the teachings? How many of you are coming to this retreat for the first time? Would you raise your hands, please? Thank you. Not so many of you. Most of us are long-term practitioners or people who've been to the practice, you know, who've listened to Thai talk many times. And so I've been reflecting on the beginner's mind, and, and that's the question that came into my mind, is how do I maintain my beginner's mind so that I'm always enthusiastic to listen to my siblings, you know, who come up here to, to teach? How do I maintain my beginner's mind so that I'm always open? Receptive. And I realize one of those things that I have to, um, you know, a beginner's mind is a mind, it's like a child's mind that's curious about things, curious about the teachings, curious about What's going to come out of this teacher? What's there that could, that could water my seeds or touch my seeds of love, of insight, of joy? And as a child, it's our nature to always want to discover, our nature to to be really curious about things and to be open to learn and to receive. And I've thought, this is really appropriate to talk to this group, you know, because as long-term practitioners, how do you maintain your beginner's mind? Because once this beginner's mind has died out, it's also really the end of our learning process and on our spiritual path. It's an endless learning, endless process of discovering who we really are. And one of those things that I am in the community, you know, I cannot avoid these two kind of audiences, you know, the monastics and long-term practitioner. Every time I come up here, I feel like I'm really stepping out of my comfort zone and becoming transparent. And um, I learned that because we have so many retreats here, that every time we have a big retreat like this, it is really an opportunity for me to bathe into my beginner's mind again. And I love it to, all, to come in touch with people who are coming for the first time because they remind me of my beginner's mind because I sort of rub off from their enthusiasm and their openness. And so today, I'm going to talk about something that we all know. That is the five skandhas, the five aggregates. When you hear about the five aggregates, what comes up in your mind? It's like, I know it already, what the five aggregates are, right? Some of us. 
because we heard this so many times, maybe 1,001 times. And here I am. The Dharma teachers asked me to talk about the five aggregates. And so, um, let me start by sharing with you what the five aggregates are. So, we are made of five different factors. We call them the five aggregates, the five skanda. And usually, Thai draw the five aggregates as a tangerine. But as I like flowers, and I see that each one of us is a flower of humanity, I'm going to draw the five aggregates as a five-petal flower. There's the body, our feelings, our perceptions, mental formation, and our consciousness. When I first heard of the five aggregates, I thought this is a description of, you know, of a human body and mind. But then Tai had said something that had really opened my eyes. Tai has said, sometimes the five aggregates can be divided into two instead of five body and mind. And I see it as matter and energy. And the, way, the reason it's divided into five so that we can practice them. And that rang a bell to me because how do I practice this? How do I practice the five aggregates? because the teachings that we learned has to be applicable in our daily life. They have to become Dharma doors and not just merely description of reality. And that's when it really hit me that these are five different Dharma doors that I can use and that I don't need to search these Dharma doors anywhere out there, that the Dharma doors are here. All I need to do is come back to myself. And this is what I love about the practice, is that I don't need to find it elsewhere. All I need to do is come back here to myself. And I have all the Dharma doors I need to cultivate peace, to cultivate love, to cultivate insight, understanding. And that enlightenment is not out there. Enlightenment is in here. And when we come together like this as a community, we're really supporting and helping one another to water that awareness, the awareness that enlightenment is here, in here. Come back. Come back to yourself. And so, um, you know, we always hear this expression, come back to yourself. You hear it all the time. Sometimes it becomes a cliché, almost, 
if you take it for granted. Come back to yourself. Come back in order to tap into this wisdom inside yourself. And so how do we really practice these five skandhas? Where do we begin? And I, um, during this retreat, some people had really wanted to find out, what is my inner path? What is the heart path? How do I, how do I know how to practice? I have all these diff, you know, difficult sh- issues in my life. How do I approach these difficult issues? And um, with the teachings of the five skandhas, we're reminded that we start with our body. So we start with ourselves, come back to our body. So we start with the body. And um, the Buddha had taught many discourses that focus on the bodies because just practicing being aware of the body and taking care of the body can really help you to wake up, to wake up to who you really are, to your true nature. And um, the Buddha taught the, the famous uh, 16, the Sutra on Mindful Breathing, the 16 exercises. And I, I know every one of us know this Sutra on the 16 exercises of mindful breathing, these are, they should be our, you know, tools that we use all the time because the breath is something that's happening all the time. It's, it's right there at your nose, underneath your nose. So we start with the breath. The first four exercises of mindful breathing deals with the breath. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. The breath is part of the body. But what's really wondrous about the breath is that once you come in touch with the breath, it brings your mind back to your body your mind and body in unison, here and now. And so the body, the breath, becomes really accessible too. And you can just have this too, anywhere, anytime. The second exercises of mindful breathing, breathing in, I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the end. Breathing out, I follow my out-breath from the beginning to the end. In other words, we dwell completely with our breathing and not take off midway, which a lot of us do at one point or another. Somehow we think we're sitting there and we're breathing, but we're maybe miles away. Have anybody ever had that experience? I have. So that practice is quite challenging too, symbol as it might be, following the in-breath and the out-breath. And then the third exercise is aware of my body, I breathe in. Smile into my body, I breathe out. We become aware of our body. This is also another challenging practice because a lot of us are uncomfortable with our body. We'd rather have another body than this body. And um, and we run away in our head so that we don't have to confront our body. We can't accept our body because it's not good enough. It's not beautiful enough. I think a lot of women have this kind of you know, attitude to our body, so it's not good enough, it's not beautiful enough. And our practice is to come back and accept our body, no matter how it is, 
no matter whether it's healthy or not so healthy, whether it's beautiful or not beautiful, beautiful or not, it's all in our head. And um, to be able to accept our body completely, we feel at peace. We feel at peace with ourselves. There's no need to run anywhere, you know, to find all sorts of things to adorn our body so that we look attractive. And then um, the last one is to um, aware of the tension in the body and to release the tension in the body as we breathe in and out. So this is, this, these are four very simple practices in caring for the body. They're simple, but not, they're not easy to do. They're simple, but they are the very foundation for other practices that we'll talk about later on. Because if we cannot be with our body something that's really tangible, we can't be aware of our body, it may be quite challenging to be with our feelings or our perceptions or our mental formations or our consciousness. So it's really important to start with the body. And um, when we come back to our body, really look into our body. You can really see many wonderful things about our body. One of those things is that we're made of, we're made of so many different elements. This body is made of so many different elements. You know, not just the food that I eat, not just the water I drink, but it's made of my ancestors. It's made of my parents. It's made of by the whole cosmos. This is the insight of interbeing, the insight of no self. And by simply practicing with the body, we, come, we can come in touch with these deep insights. And these deep insights can experience in our daily life, in our daily activities, such as eating, or defecating, or urinating. Defecating and urinating are really opportunity for meditation, for deep looking. And if we really dwell with our body, we are mindful of our body, when we defecate, when we urinate, when we eat, we can really come in touch with the nature of interconnectedness between our body and everything there is. And this is the insight that we want to experience because this is the insight that really liberates us, that really frees us from this idea, this narrow idea and narrow image of who we are. See, we create this image about ourselves. We create this image that we're like this, we're like that. And when someone comes and sort of threaten these images that we have of ourselves, that's when we can see the worst in ourselves coming up to defend this image that we have. And so the, I, the insight of interconnectedness can really help us to be free from ideas and images of ourselves so that we can really tap into who we really are, that we're more than this just body. That we are our ancestors too. That we are the whole cosmos. It makes us kind. 
and open. When we have this insight, it makes us free. When we can embody this insight and this insight can be experienced you know, by being with the body. And um, for the monastics, we have the practice of the mindful manners. And these are like very basic practices that a novice, that we start even before, before noviceship as an aspirant already, like some of our brothers, aspirants here, that we start with our mindful manners. We start by becoming aware of our body, of the way we hand, uh, hold our body, the way we walk, the way we speak, the way we relate to people through our bodily gestures. And, and, um, and I'll guarantee you that if you cannot be aware of the body through these simple minor ma mindful manners, I always share this to my younger sisters, I don't think you can really come in touch with your mind. And, um, and so, another wonders when we come in touch with our body is that we come in touch with its vulnerabilities. The, f the, the five um, awarenesses that I really, you know, take it to heart. It's the awareness that I'm a fit nature to grow old. I cannot escape old age. And growing old means having ache and pain here and there. Right? Sickness is another part of it's. It's another reality. I'm of a nature to get sick. I cannot escape sickness. And then eventually, I'm of a nature to die. I cannot escape death. There's this deep fear inside, inside us. Fear of growing old, fear of having wrinkles, I fear of getting gray hair. I've uh, just the last two years since Thai's illness and turned out, I noticed that I have so much more gray hair. And my sister said, that's because you have more responsibility. They wanted to pull out my gray hair, you know, so that it's not so noticeable. And I have to like always wear my headscarf on my head so that I can cover my little short hair so that the gray hair are not so transparent. And I have to accept the fact that it's a practice that I'm doing that I'm getting old. You know, I'm growing old. And um, facing this facing aging, facing illness, or facing death can be quite scary. You know, it, it, they, they really challenge your beliefs about yourself. Beliefs, you have these ideas in our head that we're not going to grow old. We remain young forever, right? that death is a hundred, two hundred, a million years from now for us. So being with our body and uh, being aware of our body help us to face these fears in ourselves. And it's wonderful to face these fears, facing these fears of getting old, of illness and of death helps us to live, to help us to be free from this fear, help us to see the beauties in getting old. I know some of you are much older than me, like my friend here, Erlin, and such um, insight and wisdom and beauty coming with that age. It's, I call it the ripening age. As you age, you become ripened ripened 
with life experience, with insight. So actually, growing old, it's beautiful, right? And um, there was there's a sutra that I that had really um, shook me out of um, my complacency. It's called the Divine Messenger. Have you heard of this sutra, the Divine Messenger? So there's this man that had, you know, created a lot of suffering for himself and for other people. And as he passed away, he was confronted by King Yama, which is the the king, the, the, the Lord of Death. And King Yama asked him, have you ever met the divine, the first divine messenger in your life? And he said, no, I don't think so. And King Yama said, asked him, have you ever met an aging person whose hair is all gray, whose teeth are fallen off, whose legs are walking, who are, are trembling, whose shoulders and back are bent? And he said, yes, I have. And King Yama asked him further, didn't it ever occur to you that you will become old like that? And, um, you know, I mean, look around us. We have so many divine messengers, the first divine messengers around us. As a young person, that's really important to remember. <laughs> because it helps, it helps us to appreciate whatever we have right now, the life that we have right now. And it, it reminds us that life is short, that we have to live each moment of our life deeply. We don't have to wait until we get there to live our life because we have this idea in our head. Maybe I do, maybe I don't know if you do, but I have to get to that place out there before I practice or before I will live my life deeply. This is a belief system that is so ingrained in every one of us. And so having these divine messengers around us are really bells of mindfulness. So we have to bow deeply in gratitude you know, to the divine messenger for reminding us that life is impermanent. That it's that we have to live deeply the moment that we have now in this body, however it may be, however it may be, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. And then King Yama asked him further, have you ever met the second divine messenger? And he said, I don't think so. And King Yama asked him, have you ever met someone who is really sick? Who is at the verge of death? Who is in terrible pain? He said, uh, yes, I have. Didn't it ever occur to you that you're going to be sick just like that person? And so sickness it's inevitable. It's part of having a human body. And now at my age, I'm starting to feel like ache and pain in my body. My shoulders, my neck, my back. And um, at first when I had it, it was quite frustrating. It's like, my goodness. You know, I used to have this really healthy body. And now here I am having this pain when I do sit in meditation and like having terrible shoulder pain, 
But then I stopped myself and said, this is good. This helps me to see that I'm vulnerable. It helps me to prepare. As I get older, I know it can get worse. So right now, it's not so bad. I can bear this pain because it could be worse. So I'm able to live in peace with my body, with this pain, and learning and finding ways to take care of this pain, you know, through the way I eat, through exercises, through, you know, my times, you know, my scheduling my time, like when to go to sleep instead of staying up too late. So it's really about mindfulness. And, um, and it is. We don't have to look outside to find the second di me divine messenger. We are ourselves, our body is a divine messenger. And w however painful it might be, you know, physical pain can be really terrible pain, can be devastating. But a change of attitude towards them can really help us to live in peace with the pain and to really see the pain as opportunities. When we see ourselves victims of of situations, of this situation, victims of, you know, this sick body, it can be really depressing. But when we really see, when we see that this is a, an opportunity, an op opportunity for me to really be in the shoes of humanity, because we are all of the nature to get sick, and to see that there are other people who are much more serious than I am. So I don't have to be, you know, feel victimized about, about it. I see that this is really an opportunity for me. And then the third divine messenger. Yeah, may I ask, have you ever met the third divine messenger? Yes. Have you ever met someone uh, like a dying body? I said, yes, I have. Didn't it ever occur to you that you, you will die someday? Because when we are, when we are aware that we will die someday, and we really treasure the life that we have, it's as if we are living the last day of our life. Think about it, living the last day, just like we talked about, uh, the f experiencing for the first time helps us to really appreciate things and be curious and open. But if we are really seeing that this is our last opportunity to live, our last day, and it could be our last day, we really live those moments deeply. We would not allow petty issues to really take away our joy of being alive. So if you have, you know, petty issues in your life, like irritation at this person or that person, or think about this may be your last day, last opportunity, then you know you can drop and let go of these things easily. So being aware of the body, our body can really help us to be free. And if that's all you take home today, that can take you very far on the path of waking up because that's all we need.
feelings. How do we practice with our feelings? The Buddha taught four exercises to face, to, to work out, to practice with the feeling. The first one is to generate joy. Second one, to generate happiness. We generate joy and happiness because joy and happiness is within. All we need to bring is, all we need to do is bring our, bo- our mind back to the body. We can really feel the joy and the happiness of being alive here and now. And so this joy and happiness is not something out there that we have to run to. Most of us run out there to look for joy and happiness, but joy and happiness are within. And bringing our attention to our in-breath and our out-breath and be becoming aware of our body, becoming aware of our feeling, can really help us to tap into this joy of being alive. And there are so many practices that we can do to cultivate joy and happiness. Coming in touch with nature is one of those practices that help us to come in touch with joy. Coming in touch with the beauties and goodness and wonders inside ourselves, our ways to tap into joy and happiness inside. We have this um, default that we always go in the direction of something that's wrong about ourselves and about everything. In other words, we see what's wrong much more than when we see what's right. And um, we look at someone and we see what's wrong about that person. So our practice is to recognize what's right. The wrong are still there. But if we can recognize what's right and what's good about you know, ourselves, our body, the other people, the situation, it really helps to change our perspective. and it water wholesome seeds in ourselves, the seeds of joy and the seeds of happiness in ourselves. So instead of looking at someone and having judgment about that person for all these flaws that we see, maybe it's wise to shift our attention to see what's good about that person, what's right about that person. Just like looking in ourselves, instead of seeing all this suffering and pain and ache in the body, to see the goodness, like having a body, wow. That's a miracle, right? Having youth, it's a miracle. Having good enough legs to carry me around. So looking at what's good, what's wholesome, focusing on the goodness and the beauties and the wonders can really take us a long way on the path of healing, the path of joy and happiness. And it's a training. It's we have to constantly remind ourselves that we need to come in touch with the beauties and wonders and goodness in ourselves and other people. Otherwise, we go into this default mode. And there, there, last week we heard from Brother Mitchell about feelings. You know, that it's, there are positive feelings and there are negative feelings, and what feelings are. I want to talk about how we embrace the feelings. Whenever, whenever a painful feeling comes up and we embrace it with mindfulness, we bring our attention to that feeling. It's as if we are... And most of the painful or negative feeling are quite dark. When we are in a space of negative feeling, we're like in a dark tunnel. And it's good to light up 
this light of mindfulness in ourselves, bring the light of mindfulness to that feeling so that it can shed light into that feeling. And just the fact that we're there holding that feeling, that pain that may be there, that discomfort, that feeling of inadequacy, holding it with the help of the breath can really help to dissipate that energy and help us to see deeply into that feeling, to see the causes and conditions that brought about that feeling. It helps us to see that the roots of our feeling, the painful feeling, is coming from deep place inside ourselves. It's coming from our ancestors. And it's very liberating to have that kind of insight. And that insight is not coming from analyzing and speculating. It comes because we tend this feeling with mindfulness and with gentleness and with love. It comes when there's clarity in mind. And so the feeling, can you hear okay? It goes on and off, right? Being with the feeling, breathing with the feelings can really help us to have to create space inside ourselves so that we would not be overwhelmed by the painful feeling. Because, you know, some, some young people can take their life because of a painful feeling, of a painful emotion. And so, learning how to embrace our painful feeling, being with it, with our ideas and association and stories that we have in our head, but simply open to what's there with curiosity, with gentleness, with this light of awareness can help to transform this feeling, can help this feeling to dissipate and can help us to see deeply into it. It can be really freeing this insight that comes from like a gut feeling, you know, how it came about. So let us go to perception because I realize I don't have so much time. So the Buddha taught four exercises in dealing with perceptions. And uh, Sister Annabelle had talked about it the other day, um, had touched on it. And these four exercises are from exercises 13 to 16, dealing with perception. So contemplating on the impermanence of our dharma, contemplating on the nature of non-craving and attachment of our dharmas, contemplating on the nature of no birth, no death, contemplating on letting go. These are the four uh, mindful, mindful breathing exercises that help us to confront our perception. Feelings and perceptions are mental formations, but they're, just, they're so significant. They're significant parts of our life that they're divided into one of the skandhas so that we can, we can practice with feelings and also we can practice with perception. So perceptions are constructions of mind, ideas we have about ourselves, about how permanent we are. So there's a contemplations that help us to confront the impermanence of our body and the impermanence of our dharma, of everything there is. We have ideas about a birth and death, dying and being born and dying. And so these four exercises help us to confront these ideas. They challenge our ideas about things, our belief systems, and they help us to break free from these ideas we have about ourselves. And I, in my experience, I found that Perception is it's one of those things that create enormous suffering for myself. 
It's as if they are the main cause of my suffering. When I came into the community, everyone looked wonderful. You know, when I came in for the first time, everyone was so beautiful. I, I felt like, you know, I was so, so, um, I engaged in socializing from morning until evening because I thought there are so many wonderful things about these people and I've got to learn from them. And I spend all my time, you know, chatting and talking and sharing and listening. But then as time goes on, I realized I have these ideas about other people. I mean, what prevent me from really coming in touch with my sisters and my brothers and to be open completely to them was my perceptions of them. Now I have, I put them in a box and this is how they are. And I relate to them with this perception that I have. And, um, and I had suffered. And there are people that I just could not get close to because I have created this image about them in my head, this perception. And then I had an opening, an eye-opening experience that really made me think twice about my perceptions. The Buddha said that most of our perception, maybe 95%, 95% uh, of our perceptions are wrong perceptions. But a lot of us, like myself, I think 95 of my perceptions are correct. I'm right. I'm always right. And I still feel so now that 95% of my perceptions are right. And um, I had an eye-opening experience that helped me to really re-examine my perceptions perceptions about myself and my perceptions about other people. I have a perceptions about myself too. I have all these ideas and image about myself which really limit me because I'm more these, than these ideas and perception. And yet, these ideas and perceptions are so real and so difficult to let go. So this, um, this experience I had was when I was taking care of my mother. She had a stroke when I was already a nun. And I was taking care of her in Deer Park. We're from the United States. And I, I flew over to s- take care of her. And my brother also, my brother also a monk here, flew over and we both took our mother to Deer Park Monastery to take care of her. And it was during the time that I was taking care of registration to bring people to Vietnam to support Thai's effort to renew Buddhism in Vietnam. And I was the only person that did this registration work. And even though I asked the community when I brought my mom to Deer Park if anybody could help me with this and take over, but anyway, so Every day when my brother is taking care of my mom, mom, then I will do registration. And I would spend morning until late evening just to work on emails and doing all this, you know, like taking care of housing, taking care of money, all that kind of thing. And the day that he's off, I take care of my mom. And I have to say that it was the most rewarding thing that I have ever done. There are times when I just stopped and looked in and thought, I've never experienced such peace and satisfaction just to be able to take care of my mom. And then the time came and I I had to go to Vietnam with the Sangha because, you know, and I had to to go before the Sangha in order to start to welcome people. So people arrived. 400 people came, and uh, I checked everyone in, took care of all the logistics and all the money. And then the next day, I had a breakdown. 
I had a mental breakdown. In my meditation, when an idea came into my head, it became so real. It was reality for me. A thought that comes into my head, I had to be super mindful so that I would not re see this as reality because that's what it felt. And I thought, wow, this is quite dangerous. I think I'm going mad. And, that it, and it, it made me think people who are, co who are crazy or who are mentally disturbed, mentally drenched, maybe this might be there. Maybe this might be the, f the reasons why they're so deranged, that they had too much stress in their life. It was stressful. Taking care of my mother, as rewarding as, uh, as it was, it was very stressful to take care of, you know, of her after the stroke and how confused she was and how lost she was. But also the work of doing registration it wasn't just 400 people that, you know, 400 people registered. There were like a thousand or more people asking for information and all kinds of stuff. So I realized that it was the stress. That stress could make people crazy. And I was like that. And really, I didn't know what to do. Nobody knew about it. I had enough practice to keep me, you know, to, 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 to be calm and at peace. But in my head, it was quite scary because reality and thoughts no longer had a clear division. And so I, I came up to a friend. I was, I was really lucky because a friend, an acupuncturist, was there you know, part of the delegation. And I shared with him, and he gave me a treatment, just two needles, and I had a friend, second body, who's also here right now. He gave me two needles, and I was there, lying on the floor. And I could see how my e the energy in my head was like And I, I found clarity again. And it was really a wake up, ex wake, up, wake up call for me because I realized that in I, my daily life, I always have these perceptions. And they reality for me. Maybe not as how I experienced it. You know, where I couldn't distinguish reality and a thought. But most of the time, it becomes a reality, and I don't even know it. I didn't even know they were in my head a reality. I think I see someone and I have this perception, and that's the reality of that person. And may in, in, in truth, that may not be the, you know, that person's reality. It might, there is just my perception. But in my perception, that's reality about that person. So it was really scary to think that I would go around life creating ideas and image about myself and other people when it has very little to do with reality. So it helps me to be, to ask myself the question, am I sure? You know, Thai, that's a mantra that Thai offer us. Are you sure about your perception? And, um, and it's, it's an ongoing process. It's ongoing practice for me to, to question myself, am I sure? To give myself the credit of the doubt that this perception I have may be just a construction of the mind, maybe ideas that I have and not reality of who I am and who that person is. So it helps me to be open. It helps me to be open to see and to be curious to know what's more than these perceptions that I have, ideas that I have.
So the mental formations, which has to do with the, the four exercises of mindful breathing, aware of the, uh, from exercises 9 to 11, I mean to 12, aware of the mental formations, I breathe in, aware of the mental formations, I breathe out. The mental formation may be positive ones, or maybe negative ones. Faith, diligence, kindness are mental, uh, positive and wholesome mental formations. Jealousy, anger, ignorance, these are negative mental formations. And to, um, the practice is to recognize them all, to welcome them all and not to push them away, and not to judge ourselves for these negative ones, because they're part of us. And um, to bring the light of mindfulness and shine it on these mental formations that unfold in our head, in our mind, without judgment, without criticism, without beating ourselves down but simply acknowledging it. One of the, the things that I really like about the practice is that we're very gentle with ourselves. And we learn to be, we learn to be accepting instead of struggling, fighting, creating a battlefield in ourselves to embrace ourselves with gentleness, with care, and with love, with kindness even if what comes out can be negative. But what's really wondrous about recognizing and embracing and noticing these mental formations with mindfulness is that when we bring awareness and mindfulness to a negative mental formation, we sort of like have, we have like a distance with it instead of allowing it to completely overwhelm us, we have, we sort of like step back, a step back in order to look and to see. In other words, we can be free from it when we are noticing it and embracing it. But also when we embrace the mental formations, it loses its power. It no longer has the charge to take us over. So, bringing awareness, bringing non-judgmental, bringing a curiosity to the, ma to the mental formations, as if we want to know what this is. Where is this coming from? And, it, and it's, it's quite fun, too, to be able to step back and like, question ourselves. It gives us an opportunity to see deeply into these mental formations. It helps us to understand ourselves better. And this is how we can really see that these mental formations are not really ours, just like our perceptions and our feelings. A lot of it has to do with our ancestors. A lot of it has to do with our, the way we were brought up. And so, breathing, aware of the mental formation. Bringing mindfulness, bringing awareness to the mental formation. It's a way to heal ourselves, and a way to, to stop this ceaseless, ceaseless thinking that comes up in our head, ceaseless feelings, ceaseless stories that, that, that happens in our head all the time. So let's go to consciousness. Consciousness, Sister Gina was talking about consciousness the other day. So, 
this is our consciousness. You learned about the store consciousness, right? Perception, mental formation, perceptions, feelings, body, are all come from our consciousness, the base of our consciousness, which is the store consciousness. All of this has sprung up from the depths of our being. We learned that the other day. Sister China talked about it, so I don't need to, to talk too much about it. What I want to talk about it today is water and seeds, a practice that we can do fast for our consciousness. And I see that every day, every moment of our day, from the moment we wake up to the moment when we go to sleep, and even in our sleep, we're watering seeds and tapping se tapping into seeds in the depths of our store consciousness, in the depths of our consciousness all the time. It's, it's an endless watering, tapping, touching seeds. And um, And consciousness is not something that's confined to us. Consciousness is not up here, it's not local. It's everywhere in the body, but it's also out there too. Because whatever we see may be a manifestation of our consciousness. Just like the feeling I have is a manifestation from the, my store consciousness. Or the perception I have, wrong it may be, it's a manifestation for my store consciousness. And so how do I water seeds in my store consciousness so that my perception, my feelings, my mental formations carry wholesome energy, positive energy? In other words, how do I water my seeds so that the quality of my life in my thinking, in my feelings, in my speech, in my actions are kindness and love and peace. So that's a koan for me every single day is how do I water my seeds. Because whatever I water in myself, that's how I am. That's what I am. It comes up and it becomes a part of me. It determines the quality of my being. So if I look at someone and I see all her shortcomings and all her negativities, I'm really consuming, I'm eating. I'm watering these negative seeds in myself. I'm actually consuming what I see, the negativities, through my senses and also through my thinking. And so the quali quality of my life, the quality of my peace and happiness and kindness depends on the wholesome seeds that I water in myself. And I, um, we were talking about consciousness as food because, you know, we consume, our consciousness is consuming every moment, every single moment of our life. It's consuming, there's inputs coming in all the time. And so consciousness is one of the nutriments. Consciousness as food is one of the nutriments, one of the four nutriments. And one 
One time, I was, um, you know, when Thai got sick last, not last November, the November before, last, the winter before, I was quite sad. You know, I looked at myself and at my younger siblings and I thought, wow, who's going to continue to guide us? And, um, and then one, I, uh, one day I visited Thai in the hospital. It was quite heartbroken, you know, Thai was in a coma. And um, really devastating to see, you know, Thai in that state. And then I went home, and in the chanting that evening, as I was chanting with the whole community, I realized the words we were chanting, the, sutra that, the sutras that we were learning and chanting were translated by Thai. I have read sutras, believe me, from other teachers, and you know, I cannot feel it. But there's such clarity and such insight in the sutras that Thai had transmitted to us. And I realized, I look at my sisters and I realized our community is created by Thai. Thai had sort of set us on this path creating the way our community is functioning and flowing. And I realize Thai is, is everywhere. In other words, we are embraced by this consciousness of Thai through Thai's teachings, through the sutras and discourses that Thai had translated, sutra and discourses that Thai had written through his from his insights and experiences, the way we function in the community, they were all Thai's consciousness. It was the wisdom and the insight that came from Thai. And we are sort of like under or in this balloon of Thai's consciousness. And so Thai was everywhere. Thai was present. It was something tangible. It wasn't just ideas in my head. And so, just being here, our wholesome seeds are watered through this consciousness that Thai enveloped us, but also through the consciousness of everybody, because everyone here are really taking up the practice to water the wholesome seeds in us, in, in, in ourselves, and that we are being enveloped by this balloon of wholesome consciousness. It's like we are being ballooned by this light, the light of peace and the light of love. And even if you may not practice, in, you know, I think of the children, the children and the teenagers who, who, who come here, they don't, they're not so aware of the practice. You know, when I came here, even though I was here not as a child, not as, as a teenager, I was already 22, I wasn't really practicing. I was just hanging out with my friends. You know, morning until like 2, 3 o'clock at night, I was always hanging out with my friends. And so we're not aware of the practice, the children and the young people. Practice wasn't really necessary, right? Only when we suffered that we think the practice is necessary. But the collective energy of peace and of love can water the holes and seeds in them, and these seeds can take them very far on their path of happiness, of healing, of awakening. 
And so there's, we can see when we look at these five skandhas, we can see how interconnected they are. Our body, our mind, our body feeling, perception, mental formations, are manifesting from the consciousness. And that when we look into our body, we can really feel and see our feelings and perceptions and mental formations in consciousness. A mental formation or a perception or a feeling, the their energy, the mental aspect, but when they manifest, they manifest on the body. So you can actually, when you feel like irritated and angry or sad, try to come back to your body. Try to go to parts of your body that's like tight and painful, intense. Maybe that's where your feelings and your emotions and your perceptions are held, are manifested. So you can actually localize mental aspects in the body. And it's through coming back to the body, coming back to and recognize this pain and this tightness and these blocks in the body and breathing through them that we can help do these this mental aspects or these blocks of feelings and perceptions or suffering to dissipate, to disintegrate. So taking care of the body is at the same time taking care of our mind, taking care of our consciousness. And so we can see how interconnected they are, these five aspects. The mind affects the body very intimately, and the body affects the mind also equally intimate. And so the whole of our practice is all about watering seeds, watering wholesome seeds. And seeds are potentials. In other words, we have all kinds of potentials down there in the depths of our consciousness, like a whole spectrum from the most positive to the most negative. And when we're here, we are aspire to water only the most positive seeds, the wholesome seeds in ourselves. We've suffered enough, we've watered enough negative seeds in our life, right? You tell me, I don't know. You water enough negative seeds in your life and come in here, come into a practice like this. It's really, it's really self-love. We come in here to love ourselves, to learn how to love ourselves, to learn how to water the wholesome seeds, how to, have, how to tap into these wholesome potentials, wholesome capacities in ourselves. And what do you call that if that's not love? <coughs> it's self-love. If we can't do it ourselves, we, nobody can do it for us. And one of those precious seeds that's in the depths of our consciousness is the seed of the seed of mindfulness. It's the seed of enlightenment. In other words, when we come together like this, we are really watering that seed of awakening in us. And, and this is what we need in our world today. We need more people to wake up. Thai has said, for humanity to be to have a, a, a to, to be possible, to have a, a future, we need to wake up. And so, no matter how our practice is, just the fact that we're coming together as one strong Sangha body, like now, I can just really see how powerful the Sangha body is. We are doing it out of love for ourselves. 
but we are also doing this for the whole humanity because this energy that we're generating together in this room ripples out and it touches lives in ways that's beyond our imagination, beyond our understanding. And maybe people on the other side of the planet right now, people who are in warring countries or who are in deep suffering, maybe they may be struck by one of these ripples that we send out and could have a smile on their face. And so our practice is taking care of ourselves cultivating the seeds of awakening in ourselves, the seeds of joy, the seeds of love, the seeds of kindness in ourselves. But at the same time, we're doing it for everyone, for the whole humanity, because we know how interconnected we are, how intimately interconnected we are. So I have to join my palm and bow to every single one of you just for choosing to come here, choosing to be part of this, this awakening process for ourselves and for the whole humanity. So thank you for listening and thank you for being here.